Ning Zhao, good morning. And, and that was my attempt in uh, Chinese to say good morning. When I found out that I was coming to China, which is the first time that I've been to this country, uh, my friends went out and bought me this Chinese a language map. And so I've been studying it. But I also realized that uh, not to be outdone in the United States, there's a bit of a disclaimer on the back that says, uh, to obtain the maximum benefit from your language map, consider purchasing a copy of Chinese in 10 minutes a day. So that's my next step before I come, my next trip to, to China. Uh, thank you very much for having me, the uh, Inter International Wood Culture Society, for the invite to, to address this, this auspicious audience. I think uh, before we get started too much, I'd like to set the background about what I'm going to be talking about, in particular the southwest of the United States. Uh, we're going to talk about the United States boundaries, the forest cover of North America and the southwestern eco-regions. Here's the United States, and I have to confess, Alaska down there in the bottom left, as was mentioned, I spent 18 years in Alaska. That's not really the size of Alaska. If you put it to the rest of the country, it's a, it uh, touches all four corners just about. But we're going to be talking about um, this area here. Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, in particular southern Colorado. And it's a very, uh, very unique place. Um, This is a forest cover type of North America. And what I'd like to draw your attention to specifically is if you look at Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, um, there's not a lot of wood here. Uh, this is the muggy on rim right here. A few sparse places in New Mexico, mostly in northern New Mexico, as you can see there. That's where the majority of the wood is in the southwest. Again, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado blown up here. Uh, this is the, uh, if you can see the ranges, we've got the uh, basin in the ranges here. We've got the Colorado Plateau, which is here. The Southern Rocky Mountains in the red. The Middle Rocky Mountains up here. The Great Plains, which is the lighter color. And then the Wyoming Basin, which is further north. You can barely see it right up here. So those are the ecosystems of the region here. And again, most of the timber is along here in Arizona, and some up in the Four Corners area, and then northern New Mexico, which is this area right here. About 33% uh, of the U.S. land, or about 747 million acres, is in forested land. Um, Let's talk a little bit about, about the culture of the Southwest. It's a Western culture and most clearly has its roots in the culture of the United States. As South, Southwestern states, its culture has been greatly influenced by several large immigration populations, especially those from Latin America. Arizona is becoming a major hub to the character of the United States. Many high-tech corporations are located there. And Arizona is a composite culture derived from historically in this order. Uh, Indians, most of whom are on reservations now. Uh, Anglos from the Midwest who moved for the most more favorable climate in the southern United States. And then the Hispanic from Sonora, what is now northern Mexico. And here you get a flavor of what uh, the southwest is like. Most of it is very dry. And this this uh, area right here in particular, waters, is a prime resource, as you can imagine, in the southwest in part of the United States. But it's got beautiful, uh, beautiful pictures, four corners. Uh, um, this is Ponderosa's opinion type right here. I wouldn't, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you a picture of the Grand Canyon if I'm talking about Arizona, because that's one of the magnificent uh, places in the United States. Um, but as you can imagine, the elevation here um, goes from about uh, two to 3,000 feet up to 5,000 5, or 6,000 feet. So it's quite a, oops, quite a bit of uh, contrast in elevation. Here are the timber types of the southwest where we do have forested areas. We've got aspen, uh, ponderosa pine, and spruce fir. 
Uh, ponderosa and pine and spruce fir are commercially what we call the dimension lumber. That's where we get uh, uh, wood to build homes, things of that nature. Uh, aspen is used uh, mostly for furniture, for wildlife habitat, and excelsior. And then there's a the pinyon juniper forest type in southwest, southwestern United States too. And again, the uh, pinyon juniper aren't real good for structure, but some folks make furniture out of it. It's very good for wildlife habitat and uh, also firewood too, which is uh, frequently used in the southwest. Four major cities in the southwest. Albuquerque, New Mexico, you can see that it's in, actually it's about 7,000 or 5,000 feet, Albuquerque, New Mexico is. Uh, Durango, Colorado, Flagstaff, Arizona, and if you'll notice in Flagstaff, it's uh, pretty much in the, the forested area here in northern Arizona. And then Phoenix, Arizona, which is in southern uh, Arizona, and that's in a, uh, in a very arid desert climate. Let's talk a little bit about native culture and the influence on the wood products. Um, here are the different types of the tribes of uh, Arizona and New Mexico in particular. The Navajo here, the Hopi, the Apache, the Zuni, and the Pueblo tribes. And there are actually 12 Pueblo tribes in New Mexico. But these constitute the, uh, the tribes and the native populations in Arizona and New Mexico. Here's a portrait of the different past and presence of the native community. Uh, you can see uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of init initial slides, folks. Uh, and then more recently, you can see this uh, pop star uh, coming into play. Um, really, a, really quite an organization in the Southwest, the native community. Okay, let's talk about the uh, Hogan. The uh, Navajo Hogan, as you can see here, and this shows you a uh, normal, uh, this is the more advanced Hogan here, this is less advanced, and then the primitive uh, Hogan that was constructed uh, shows you a natural progression of, uh, of from very primitive to more advanced. The Hogan is considered a sacred to those who practice the Navajo religious way of life. The Hogan was the family home and the, to the Navajo people. In it, the children played, the women cooked, weaved and talked and entertained, and men told jokes and stories. The Navajos made the Hogans in a circular fashion until the 1900s when they started to make them in hexagonal and octagonal shapes. The change in shape may have been due to the arrival of the railroad. A supply of wooden cross ties which could be laid horizontal to form the walls of larger, taller homes allowed the retention of the shape of the Hogan. And if you go here, you can see more of the wood starting to enter into the picture of the Hogan. Many cultural tra taboos are associated with the Hogan and its use. Should a death occur in the structure, the body is either buried in the Hogan with the entry sealed to warn out others away, or the deceased is extracted through a hole knocked to the north side of the structure, and it is abandoned and often burned. A Hogan may also become taboo for further use if lightning strikes near the structure or bear rubs against it. Wood from such structures is never reused for any other purpose by Navajo. This next to the thought is very, I think is very interesting too. The tra traditional structured Hogans are also considered pioneers in efficiency, energy efficiency homes. Using packed mud against the entire wood structure, the home was kept cool by natural air ventilation and water sprinkled on the dirt ground inside. During the winter, the fireplace kept the inside warm for a long period of time as well as into the night. And this concept is called a thermal mass. I'm not sure if they knew it at the time, but uh, it worked very well. This is a Hogan that was recently constructed at the uh, Northern Arizona University.
The preference of Hogan construction and use is still very popular among the Navajos, although the use of the home and the shelter dwindled through the 1900s, due mainly to the requirements by many Navajos to acquire homes built through government and lender funding, which largely ignored the Hogan style and sacred space, and preference to low cost, low bid, standardized construction. With government and lender requirements requiring low cost as well as bathrooms and kitchens, the Hogan as a personal home was dwindling away, save for those who could build their own. That began to officially change in 1990 when various small projects to find ways to bring the Hogan back. And in 2001, which is what, 12 years ago, 11 years ago, it became, it changed significantly with a joint venture of partnership between the Navajo Nation, Northern Arizona University, and the U.S. Forest Service. They began to manufacture and build log homes from a Navajo majority owned log factory and home in Cameron, Arizona. Using surplus small diameter wood from culled out forests to mitigate from mitigating devastated wildfires and with a series of meetings between elders, medicine men, and project leaders, a log hogan revival is now being born in the Navajo Nation. While keeping the sacred space of the hogan relatively untouched, and also meeting the requirements for modern home amenities, a nation tradition is now once again beginning to flourish. Along the assurance of the survival of the cultural heritage, this project has also created new jobs, summer school, home construction, ex experienced by Navajo teens. I think this is a real good example of how uh, the United States has really tried to look back and taken something that has been historic to these Navajo people and incorporated, incorporated into something new now where they can not only live a more comfortable lifestyle, but at the same time uh, protect that value that, is, that has been in the past. And I, I did want to point one more th one thing out here. If you look at this whole gun here, you can see the addition right here. So they've got the air cooler, air, swamp cooler up here, and they've got a kitchen restroom here, but they've kept the unique value of the Hogan there. Carved kachinas. Uh, these carved kachinas were made from cottonwood that are on the, uh, they grow in the riparian areas of the uh, Colorado River and the Salt River. And a kachina is a spirit being in the Western Pueblo cosmopology and religious practices. The Western Pueblo Native American cultures located in the Southwest United States include Hopis and Pueblos. The kachina religion has spread to more Eastern Pueblos from Laguna to Ista. The term often refers to a kachina dancer, masked members of the tribe who dress up as kachinas for religious ceremonies and kachina dolls, wood figures representing kachinas, which are given as gifts to children. I might mention too that in, during the process, this has become quite a large industry in northern New Mexico, or northern Arizona, especially around Flagstaff. The kachina can represent anything in the natural world of cosmos from a reverted ancestor to an element, a location, a quality, a natural phenomenon, or a concept. There are more than 400 different kachinas in Hopi and Pueblo culture. Kachinas vary in each Pueblo community. There may be kachinas for the sun, the stars, thunderstorms, wind, corn, insects, and many other concepts. Kachinas are understood as having a human-like relationship. They may have uncles, sisters, and grandmothers, and marry, and may have children. Although not worship, each is viewed as being very powerful, and if given respect, can use their power to influence the human for good, bringing rainfall, healing, fertility, or protection, for example. We could use a little rain in the southern uh, southwest right now, so maybe we need more kachinas. But this is a big, big industry in, in, around Flagstaff, and there's a lot of uh, connotation to the kachinas as being very important revered when they actually construct the kachinas. Gathering pinion pine nuts, um, very important to Southwest. The size and taste of the pinion nut made it a seasonal staple for man and animal in use in the West. 
Uh, if you can look here, you can see the size of the nuts of the pinion. This is the cone here, and here are the nuts here. You can see how large they are. So the, um, the native ground the seeds to make soup and mush and roasted the seeds to eat like a nut. The large seeds is so nut-like it is commonly called a pinion nut or a pine nut. It is still common for many of the Ameri Arizona and New Mexico tribes to supplement their diet with pine nuts by gathering them in the time-honored methods passed from generation to generation. And wildlife, particularly birds and rodents, eat pine nuts in season and store them for later use. So not only do they actually consume the pinion nuts themselves, but it's very important to wildlife in the food chain. So when they go hunting for deer, whatever, if you look at the food chain, you can take it all the way down to the pinion nut in some, some examples. Pinion pine may be found throughout Arizona and New Mexico, as we mentioned. Uh, they cover the slopes above the valley floors and below higher elevations. The abundance of nuts vary from year to year and geographic location. Uh, the pinion seed crop is unreliable. Typically a good crop is produced anywhere from three to seven years. And successful pickers go out and they scout the areas during the summer months and then in the fall they actually harvest the pinion nuts. Cones picked before they open may be left in burlap saps and placed in sun for several days. When I was uh, working in uh, northern Arizona, we went out and collected uh, ponderosa pine nuts, but it was the same type of thing. You put them in the burlap bag and then the heat would open the cones and then the seeds would fall out and you could collect them that way. When the cones are dried and open, shake the sacks, dislodging the nuts and the cones. Another method is to lay the cones on a canvas in the sun and with a shovel turn them the cones until they're dried. I've never found that many cones myself, but I guess um, if you really know where you're going, there's probably that many. To clean the pine nuts, the Indian used the wicker trays to toss the nuts into the air and let the wind carry away the broken cones in the brackets. Again, pinion, pinion very important to the Southwest native culture. Let's talk a little bit about the native and Spanish culture that influenced the parts and products in New Mexico now. Um, Northern New Mexico is among the richest places in the world when it comes to culture and tradition. Uh, New Mexico has many Native Americans and a higher percentage of Hispanics than any other state. The Pueblo, Spanish, and Anglo cultures are the three major culture groups of the area. The origin the original Indian civilization was blended with that of the Spanish. This distinctive civilization was in turn modified by the impact of the Anglos during the 19th century. This cultural heritage in modern New Mexico is quite unique among the 50 states. So what happened is you had the Pueblo Indians. They originally, then the Spanish came up from Sonora. They interacted with the culturation and then the uh, then the Anglos came in specifically from the, from the West. Native American drums, a very important part of the culture of uh, New Mexico. Uh, the drum has played an inherent role in the lives of Native Americans for centuries. Prior to the battle, the beat of the drum arose a sense of strength and solidarity. The gatherings and celebrations that, is, that created an essential social and spiritual harmony. We could use that in some of our Congress today in the United States, I think. Drum heads are made from cow, deer, elk, or goat hides and have been thoroughly cleaned and scraped to maintain the highest level of sound, appearance, and durability. And each drum has its own characteristic. And how they prepare these drums, they go out, they cut the, cut the tree down in a very environmentally sound way, and then they... Um, hollow out the center of the tree and then they soak it and then they let it dry and when it dries it becomes more more brittle and less prone to to actually uh, splitting things of that nature. Let's talk a little bit about the Spanish uh, influences on on northern New Mexico here. This is the church in northern New Mexico and it's a little dark here. Could you get the light? Is there Anybody know how to get that light? I'd like to point out the beams on this. Okay, that's all right. 
Um, these beams right here are built into the adobe. You can see here. And it's a very, very common practice in uh, northern New Mexico to combine large beams with adobe. There, thank you. That's much better. Here you can see the wood structures and the beams that are encased in the adobe. Add strength to the adobe, but it also gives you a very specific flavor of northern New Mexico. Here's another example. This, this structure here was actually built two years ago, so what they've tried to do is they've tried to incorporate, again, the, uh, the building of uh, adobe in with the native culture. Here are some examples of the Spanish influence in uh, northern New Mexico on wood. What's very interesting about the Spanish influence is that before 1700, uh, the only thing that they could make furniture out of would be pine. And pine is not as resistant as the hardwoods in Spain to do intricate designs. And so for the longest time in northern New Mexico, uh, they could not really do any kind of intricate designs. But uh, after 1700, the European Anglos came in from eastern United States and brought new tools and, and uh, brought in a sawmill that would actually help uh, find a way to use the ponderosa pine for integral, integral structures. So they were able to do it after 1700. Again, some more examples. And uh, lastly, I did want to talk briefly about uh, ponderosa pine and aspen uh, furniture construction. Here are two stands, one of, of uh, this one is aspen, this one is ponderosa pine. We have a situation in uh, northern New Mexico and Arizona in our aspen stand called sudden aspen decline. And about uh, 2005, the scientists started noticing a lot, well actually so did the administrators, a lot of dying out of these aspen stands. And if aspen, it's not that unusual for a stand to die out, but the way aspen reproduces normally is by root suckers. And they weren't getting these root suckers in. So there was something going on. So they've been studying for about six years. And what they've concluded is we had a drought in the southwest in 2000. And the effects of that drought were starting to show up in about 2005. And that's basically what's called this sudden aspen decline. And we've lost about 20 to 30% of our aspen stands in the area. And as a result, there's more opportunity for uh, wood uh, furniture construction. Here you see. Uh, two examples of the, that, uh, that are up in uh, Mangos, Colorado, which is just north of the border. So uh, there's quite an industry of that going as well. Uh, Aspen furniture here. Summary of the key points. Uh, southwestern United States is a mixture of ecosystems from the desert to the forest, the alpine. Wood is critical in the southwest because of its scarcity. Both native and Spanish influences are still evident in the Southwest, and traditional ways are being passed from one generation to the next. How am I doing on time? I'm finished. I'm finished. <laughs> Boss says I'm finished. Any questions? I've got time for questions. Or?